The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 2, by Will Durant. Concluded. Gothic and Renaissance architects found much instruction in these vaults and buttresses. Romante, designing St. Peter's, planned to raise the Pantheon over the Basilica of Constantine, that is, to crown a spacious nave with a massive dome. The first Christian emperor built many churches in Rome, probably including the original form of San Lorenzo outside the walls. To celebrate his victory at the Mulvian Bridge, he raised in 315 the arch that still towers over the Via dei Trionfi. It is one of the best preserved of Rome's remains, and its majesty is not visibly injured by the diverse pilferage of its parts. Four finely proportioned shafts, rising from sculptured bases, divide the three arches and support an ornate entablature. The attic story bears reliefs and statues taken from monuments of Trajan and Aurelius, while the medallions between the columns are from some building of Hadrian's reign. Two of the reliefs appear to be the work of Constantine's artists. The crude squat figures, the awkward quarrel of profile faces with frontal legs, the rude piling of heads upon heads as a substitute for perspective, betray a coarsening of technique and taste. But the deep drilling produces in the play of light and shade an impressive effect of depth and space, and the episodes are presented with a rough vitality, as if Italian art had resolved to return to its source. The colossal figure of Constantine in the Palazzo dei Conservatori carries this primitiveness to a repellent extreme. It seems incredible that the man who presided so graciously over the Council of Nicaea should have resembled this doer barbarian, unless the artist had a mind to illustrate in advance the cynical summary of Gibbon. I have described the triumph of barbarism and religion. Early in this fourth century, a new art took form, the illumination of manuscripts with miniature paintings. Literature itself was now predominantly Christian. Lucius Vermeanus Lactantius expounded Christianity eloquently in Divinae Institutiones, in 307, and in De Mortibus Persecutorum, of 314, described the final agonies of the persecuting emperors with Ciceronian elegance and venom. Religion, wrote Lactantius, must by its very nature be untrammeled, unforced, free, a heresy which he did not live to expiate. More famous was Eusebius Pamphili, bishop of Caesarea. He began his literary career as a priestly scribe and librarian for his episcopal predecessor, Pamphilus, whom he loved so well that he adopted his name. Pamphilus had acquired Origen's library and had built around it the largest Christian collection of books yet known. Living among these volumes, Eusebius became the most erudite cleric of his time. Pamphilus lost his life in the Galerian persecution of 310, and Eusebius was much plagued by later queries as to how he himself had survived. He made diverse enemies by taking a middle position between Arius and Alexander. Nevertheless, he became the boss way of Constantine's court and was commissioned to write the imperial biography. Part of his scholastic harvest was gathered into a universal history, the most complete of ancient chronologies. Eusebius arranged sacred and profane history in parallel columns divided by a synchronizing row of dates and tried to fix the time of every important event from Abraham to Constantine. All later chronologies rested on this canon. Putting flesh upon these bones, Eusebius issued in 325 an ecclesiastical history describing the development of the church from its beginnings to the Council of Nicaea. Here in the first chapter, again serving as a model for Bosway, was the earliest philosophy of history, portraying time as the battleground of God and Satan, and all events as advancing the triumph of Christ. The book was poorly arranged, but well written. The sources were critically and conscientiously examined, the statements were as accurate as in any ancient work of history, and at every turn Eusebius put posterity in his debt by quoting important documents that would otherwise have been lost. The bishop's learning is enormous, his style is warmed with feeling and rises to eloquence in moments of theological odium. He frankly excludes such matters as might not edify his Christian readers or support his philosophy, and he manages to write a history of the great council without mentioning either Arius or Athanasius. The same honest dishonesty makes his life of Constantine a panegyric rather than a biography. It begins with eight inspiring chapters on the emperor's piety and good works, and tells how he governed his empire in a godly manner for more than thirty years. One would never guess from this book that Constantine had killed his son, his nephew, and his wife. For like Augustus, Constantine had managed well everything but his family. His relations with his mother were generally happy. Apparently by his commission she went to Jerusalem and leveled to the ground the scandalous temple of Aphrodite that had been built, it was said, upon the Savior's tomb. According to Eusebius, the Holy Sepulchre thereupon came to light with the very cross on which Christ had died. 
Constantine ordered a church of the Holy Sepulchre to be built over the tomb, and the revered relics were preserved in a special shrine. As in classical days, the pagan world had cherished and adored the relics of the Trojan War, and even Rome had boasted the Palladium of Troy's Athene. So now the Christian world, changing its surface and renewing its essence in the immemorial manner of human life, began to collect and worship relics of Christ and the saints. Helena raised a chapel over the traditional site of Jesus' birth at Bethlehem, modestly served the nuns who ministered there, and then returned to Constantinople to die in the arms of her son. Constantine had been twice married, first to Minervina, who had borne him a son Crispus, then to Maximian's daughter Fausta, by whom he had three daughters and three sons. Crispus became an excellent soldier and rendered vital aid to his father in the campaigns against Licinius. In 326, Crispus was put to death by Constantine's order. About the same time, the emperor decreed the execution of Licinianus, son of Licinius, by Constantine's sister Constantia, and shortly thereafter Fausta was slain by her husband's command. We do not know the reasons for this triple execution. Zosimus assures us that Crispus had made love to Fausta, who accused him to the emperor, and that Helena, who loved Crispus dearly, had avenged him by persuading Constantine that his wife had yielded to his son. Possibly Fausta had schemed to remove Crispus from the path of her son's rise to imperial power, and Licinianus may have been killed for plotting to claim his father's share of the realm. Fausta achieved her aim after her death, for in 335 Constantine bequeathed the empire to his surviving sons and nephews. Two years later, at Easter, he celebrated with festival ceremonies the thirtieth year of his reign. Then, feeling the nearness of death, he went to take the warm baths at nearby Aquarian. As his illness increased, he called for a priest to administer to him that sacrament of baptism which he had purposely deferred to this moment, hoping to be cleansed by it from all the sins of his crowded life. Then the tired ruler, aged sixty-four, laid aside the purple robes of royalty, put on the white garb of a Christian neophyte, and passed away. He was a masterly general, a remarkable administrator, a superlative statesman. He inherited and completed the restorative work of Diocletian. Through them the empire lived eleven hundred fifty years more. He continued the monarchical forms of Aurelian and Diocletian, partly out of ambition and vanity, partly, no doubt, because he believed that absolute rule was demanded by the chaos of the times. His greatest error lay in dividing the empire among his sons. Presumably he foresaw that they would fight for sole supremacy, as he had done, but surmised that they would fight even more certainly if he chose another heir. This, too, is a price of monarchy. His executions we cannot judge, not knowing their provocation. Burdened with the problems of rule, he may have allowed fear and jealousy to dethrone his reason for a while, and there are signs that remorse weighed heavily upon his declining years. His Christianity, beginning as policy, appears to have graduated into sincere conviction. He became the most persistent preacher in his realm, persecuted heretics faithfully, and took God into partnership at every step. Wiser than Diocletian, he gave new life to an aging empire by associating it with a young religion, a vigorous organization, a fresh morality. By his aid, Christianity became a state as well as a church, and the mold for fourteen centuries of European life and thought. Perhaps, if we accept Augustus, the grateful church was right in naming him the greatest of the emperors. Epilogue 1. Why Rome Fell The two greatest problems in history, says a brilliant scholar of our time, are how to account for the rise of Rome and how to account for her fall. We may come nearer to understanding them if we remember that the fall of Rome, like her rise, had not one cause but many, and was not an event but a process spread over three hundred years. Some nations have not lasted as long as Rome fell. A great civilization is not conquered from without until it has destroyed itself within. The essential causes of Rome's decline lay in her people, her morals, her class struggle, her failing trade, her bureaucratic despotism, her stifling taxes, her consuming wars. Christian writers were keenly appreciative of this decay. Tertullian, about 200, heralded with pleasure the ipsa clausula seculi, literally the fin de siècle, or end of an era, as probably a prelude to the destruction of the pagan world. Cyprian, towards 250, answering the charge that Christians were the source of the empire's misfortunes, attributed these to natural causes. You must know that the world has grown old and does not remain in its former vigor. It bears witness to its own decline. The rainfall and the sun's warmth are both diminishing. The metals are nearly exhausted. The husbandman is failing in the fields. Barbarian inroads and centuries of mining the richer veins had doubtless lowered Rome's supply of precious metals. In central and southern Italy, deforestation, erosion, and the neglect of irrigation canals by a diminishing peasantry and a disordered government had left Italy poorer than before. The cause, however, was no inherent exhaustion of the soil, no change in climate, but the negligence and sterility of harassed and discouraged men. Biological factors were more fundamental. 
A serious decline of population appears in the West after Hadrian. It has been questioned, but the mass importation of barbarians into the empire by Aurelius, Valentinian, Aurelian, Probus, and Constantine leaves little room for doubt. Aurelius, to replenish his army, enrolled slaves, gladiators, policemen, criminals. Either the crisis was greater or the free population less than before, and the slave population had certainly fallen. So many farms had been abandoned, above all in Italy, that Pertinax offered them gratis to anyone who would tell them. A law of Septimius Severus speaks of a penuria hominum, a shortage of men. In Greece, the depopulation had been going on for centuries. In Alexandria, which had boasted of its numbers, Bishop Dionysius calculated that the population had in his time, by 250, been halved. He mourned to see the human race diminishing and constantly wasting away. Only the barbarians and the orientals were increasing, outside the empire and within. What had caused this fall in population? Above all, family limitation. Practiced first by the educated classes, it had now seeped down to a proletariat named for its fertility. By A.D. 100, it had reached the agricultural classes, as shown by the use of imperial alimenta to encourage rural parentage. By the 3rd century, it had overrun the western provinces and was lowering manpower in Gaul. Though branded as a crime, infanticide flourished as poverty grew. Sexual excesses may have reduced human fertility. The avoidance or deferment of marriage had a like effect, and the making of eunuchs increased as oriental customs flowed into the west. Plantianus, Praetorian prefect, had one hundred boys emasculated and then gave them to his daughter as a wedding gift. Second only to family limitation as a cause of lessened population were the slaughters of pestilence, revolution, and war. Epidemics of major proportions decimated the population under Aurelius, Gallienus, and Constantine. In the plague of 260 to 265, almost every family in the empire was attacked. In Rome, we are told, there were five thousand deaths every day for many weeks. The mosquitoes of the Campania were winning their war against the human invaders of the Pontine Marshes, and malaria was sapping the strength of rich and poor in Latium and Tuscany. The holocausts of war and revolution, and perhaps the operation of contraception, abortion, and infanticide, had a dysgenic as well as a numerical effect. The ablest men married latest, bred least, and died soonest. The dole weakened the poor, luxury weakened the rich, and a long peace deprived all classes in the peninsula of the martial qualities and arts. The Germans, who were now peopling North Italy and filling the army, were physically and morally superior to the surviving native stock. If time had allowed a leisurely assimilation, they might have absorbed the classic culture and reinvigorated the Italian blood. But time was not so generous. Moreover, the population of Italy had long since been mingled with Oriental strains physically inferior, though perhaps mentally superior to the Roman type. The rapidly breeding Germans could not understand the classic culture, did not accept it, did not transmit it. The rapidly breeding Orientals were mostly of a mind to destroy that culture. The Romans, possessing it, sacrificed it to the comforts of sterility. Rome was conquered not by barbarian invasion from without, but by barbarian multiplication within. Moral decay contributed to the dissolution. The virile character that had been formed by arduous simplicities and a supporting faith relaxed in the sunshine of wealth and the freedom of unbelief. Men had now, in the middle and upper classes, the means to yield to temptation and only expediency to restrain them. Urban congestion multiplied contacts and frustrated surveillance. Immigration brought together a hundred cultures whose differences rubbed themselves out into indifference. Moral and aesthetic standards were lowered by the magnetism of the mass, and sex ran riot in freedom while political liberty decayed. The greatest of historians held that Christianity was the chief cause of Rome's fall. For this religion, he and his followers argued, had destroyed the old faith that had given moral character to the Roman soul and stability to the Roman state. It had declared war upon the classic culture, upon science, philosophy, literature, and art. It had brought an enfeebling oriental mysticism into the realistic stoicism of Roman life. It had turned men's thoughts from the tasks of this world to an enervating preparation for some cosmic catastrophe, and had lured them into seeking individual salvation through asceticism and prayer rather than collective salvation through devotion to the state. It had disrupted the unity of the empire while soldier emperors were struggling to preserve it, it had discouraged its adherents from holding office or rendering military service. It had preached an ethic of non-resistance and peace when the survival of the empire had demanded a will to war. Christ's victory had been Rome's death. There is some truth in this hard indictment. Christianity unwillingly shared in the chaos of creeds that helped produce that medley of mores which moderately contributed to Rome's collapse. But the growth of Christianity was more an effect than the cause of Rome's decay. The breakup of the old religion had begun long before Christ— there were more vigorous attacks upon it in Ennius and Lucretius than in any pagan author after them. Moral disintegration had begun with the Roman conquest of Greece, and it culminated under Nero. 
Thereafter, Roman morals improved, and the ethical influence of Christianity upon Roman life was a largely wholesome one. It was because Rome was already dying that Christianity grew so rapidly. Men lost faith in the state not because Christianity held them aloof, but because the state defended wealth against poverty, fought to capture slaves, taxed toil to support luxury, and failed to protect its people from famine, pestilence, invasion, and destitution. Forgivably, they turned from Caesar preaching war to Christ preaching peace, from incredible brutality to unprecedented charity, from a life without hope or dignity to a faith that consoled their poverty and honored their humanity. Rome was not destroyed by Christianity any more than by barbarian invasion. It was an empty shell when Christianity rose to influence and invasion came. The economic causes of Rome's decline have already been stated as prerequisite to the understanding of Diocletian's reforms. They need only a reminding summary here. The precarious dependence upon provincial grains, the collapse of the slave supply and the latifundia, the deterioration of transport and the perils of trade, the loss of provincial markets to provincial competition, the inability of Italian industry to export the equivalent of Italian imports, and the consequent drain of precious metals to the east, the destructive war between rich and poor, the rising cost of armies, doles, public works, an expanding bureaucracy, and a parasitic court, the depreciation of the currency, the discouragement of ability and the absorption of investment capital by confiscatory taxation, the emigration of capital and labor, the straitjacket of serfdom placed upon agriculture, and of caste forced upon industry. All these conspired to sap the material bases of Italian life until at last the power of Rome was a political ghost surviving its economic death. The political causes of decay were rooted in one fact, that increasing despotism destroyed the citizens' civic sense and dried up statesmanship at its source. Powerless to express his political will except by violence, the Roman lost interest in government and became absorbed in his business, his amusements, his legion, or his individual salvation. Patriotism and the pagan religion had been bound together, and now together decayed. The Senate, losing ever more of its power and prestige after Pertinax, relapsed into indolence, subservience, or venality, and the last barrier fell that might have saved the state from militarism and anarchy. Local governments, overrun by imperial correctores and exactores, no longer attracted first-rate men. The responsibility of municipal officials for the tax quotas of their areas, the rising expense of their unpaid honors, the fees, liturgies, benefactions, and games expected of them, the dangers incident to invasion and class war, led to a flight from office corresponding to the flight from taxes, factories, and farms. Men deliberately made themselves ineligible by debasing their social category. Some fled to other towns, some became farmers, some monks. In 313, Constantine extended to the Christian clergy that exemption from municipal office and from several taxes which pagan priests had traditionally enjoyed. The church was soon swamped with candidates for ordination and cities complained of losses in revenue and senators. In the end, Constantine was compelled to rule that no man eligible for municipal position should be admitted to the priesthood. The imperial police pursued fugitives from political honors as it hunted evaders of taxes or conscription. It brought them back to the cities and forced them to serve. Finally, it decreed that a son must inherit the social status of his father and must accept election if eligible to it by his rank. A serfdom of office rounded out the prison of economic caste. Galienus, fearing a revolt of the Senate, excluded senators from the army. As martial material no longer grew in Italy, this decree completed the military decline of the peninsula. The rise of provincial and mercenary armies, the overthrow of the Praetorian Guard by Septimius Severus, the emergence of provincial generals and their capture of the imperial throne, destroyed the leadership, even the independence of Italy, long before the fall of the empire in the West. The armies of Rome were no longer Roman armies. They were composed chiefly of provincials, largely of barbarians. They fought not for their altars and their homes, but for their wages, their donatives, and their loot. They attacked and plundered the cities of the empire with more relish than they showed in facing the enemy. Most of them were the sons of peasants who hated the rich and the cities as exploiters of the poor and the countryside. And as civil strife provided opportunity, they sacked such towns with a thoroughness that left little for alien barbarism to destroy. When military problems became more important than internal affairs, cities near the frontiers were made the seats of government. Rome became a theater for triumphs, a showplace of imperial architecture, a museum of political antiquities and forms. The multiplication of capitals and the division of power broke down the unity of administration. The empire, grown too vast for its statesmen to rule or its armies to defend, began to disintegrate. Left to protect themselves unaided against the Germans and the Scots, Gaul and Britain chose their own imperatores and made them sovereign. Palmyra seceded under Zenobia, and soon Spain and Africa would yield almost unresisting to barbarian conquest. 
In the reign of Gallienus, thirty generals governed thirty regions of the empire in practical independence of the central power. In this awful drama of a great state breaking into pieces, the internal causes were the unseen protagonists. The invading barbarians merely entered where weakness had opened the door and where the failure of biological, moral, economic, and political statesmanship had left the stage to chaos, despondency, and decay. Externally, the fall of the Western Roman Empire was hastened by the expansion and migration of the Xiongnu, or Huns, in northwestern Asia. Defeated in their eastward advance by Chinese armies and the Chinese Wall, they turned westward, and about A.D. 355 reached the Volga and the Oxus. Their pressure forced the Sarmatians of Russia to move into the Balkans. The Goths, so harassed, moved again upon the Roman frontiers. They were admitted across the Danube to settle in Mesia in 376. Maltreated there by Roman officials, they revolted, defeated a large Roman army at Adrianople in 378, and for a time threatened Constantinople. In 400, Alaric led the Visigoths over the Alps into Italy, and in 410 they took and sacked Rome. In 429, Geyseric led the Vandals to the conquest of Spain and Africa, and in 455 they took and sacked Rome. In 451, Attila led the Huns in an attack upon Gaul and Italy. He was defeated at Chalon, but overran Lombardy. In 472, a Pannonian general, Orestes, made his son emperor under the name of Romulus Augustulus. Four years later, the barbarian mercenaries who dominated the Roman army deposed this little Augustus and named their leader Odoacer, king of Italy. Odoacer recognized the supremacy of the Roman emperor at Constantinople and was accepted by him as a vassal king. The Roman Empire in the east would go on until 1453. In the west, it had come to an end. 2. The Roman Achievement It is easier to explain Rome's fall than to account for her long survival. This is the essential accomplishment of Rome, that having won the Mediterranean world, she adopted its culture, gave it order, prosperity, and peace for two hundred years, held back the tide of barbarism for two centuries more, and transmitted the classic heritage to the West before she died. Rome has had no rival in the art of government. The Roman state committed a thousand political crimes. It built its edifice upon a selfish oligarchy and an obscurantist priesthood. It achieved a democracy of freemen and then destroyed it with corruption and violence. It exploited its conquests to support a parasitic Italy, which, when it could no longer exploit, collapsed. Here and there, in east and west, it created a desert and called it peace. But amid all this evil, it formed a majestic system of law, which through nearly all Europe gave security to life and property, incentive and continuity to industry, from the Decemvirs to Napoleon. It molded a government of separated legislative and executive powers, whose checks and balances inspired the makers of constitutions as late as revolutionary America and France. For a time, it united monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy so successfully as to win the applause of philosophers, historians, subjects, and enemies. It gave municipal institutions, and for a long period, municipal freedom to half a thousand cities. It administered its empire at first with greed and cruelty, then with such tolerance and essential justice that the great realm has never again known a like content. It made the desert blossom with civilization and atoned for its sins with the miracle of a lasting peace. Today our highest labors seek to revive the Pax Romana for a disordered world. Within that unsurpassed framework, Rome built a culture Greek in origin, Roman in application and result. She was too engrossed in government to create as bountifully in the realms of the mind as Greece had done, but she absorbed with appreciation and preserved with tenacity the technical, intellectual, and artistic heritage that she had received from Carthage and Egypt, Greece and the East. She made no advance in science and no mechanical improvements in industry, but she enriched the world with a commerce moving over secure seas and a network of enduring roads that became the arteries of a lusty life. Along these roads and over a thousand handsome bridges there passed to the medieval and modern worlds the ancient techniques of tillage, handicraft, and art, the science of monumental building, the processes of banking and investment, the organization of medicine and military hospitals, the sanitation of cities, and many varieties of fruit and nut trees, of agricultural or ornamental plants, brought from the east to take new root in the west. Even the secret of central heating came from the warm south to the cold north. The south has created the civilizations, the north has conquered and destroyed or borrowed them. Rome did not invent education, but she developed it on a scale unknown before, gave it state support, and formed the curriculum that persisted till our harassed youth. She did not invent the arch, the vault, or the dome, but she used them with such audacity and magnificence that in some fields her architecture has remained unequaled. And all the elements of the medieval cathedral were prepared in her basilicas. She did not invent the sculptural portrait, but she gave it a realistic power rarely reached by the idealizing Greeks. She did not invent philosophy, but it was in Lucretius and Seneca that Epicureanism and Stoicism found their most finished form. 
She did not invent the types of literature, not even the satire, but who could adequately record the influence of Cicero on oratory, the essay and prose style, of Virgil on Dante, Tasso, Milton, of Livy and Tacitus on the writing of history, of Horace and Juvenal on Dryden, Swift, and Pope. Her language became, by a most admirable corruption, the speech of Italy, Romania, France, Spain, Portugal, and Latin America. Half the white man's world speaks a Latin tongue. Latin was, till the 18th century, the Esperanto of science, scholarship, and philosophy in the West. It gave a convenient international terminology to botany and zoology. It survives in the sonorous ritual and official documents of the Roman Church. It still writes medical prescriptions and haunts the phraseology of the law. It entered by direct appropriation and again through the Romance languages— regalis, regal, royal, paganus, pagan, peasant, to enhance the wealth and flexibility of English speech. Our Roman heritage works in our lives a thousand times a day. When Christianity conquered Rome, the ecclesiastical structure of the pagan church, the title and vestments of the Pontifex Maximus, the worship of the Great Mother and a multitude of comforting divinities— the sense of supersensible presences everywhere, the joy or solemnity of old festivals, and the pageantry of immemorial ceremony passed like maternal blood into the new religion, and captive Rome captured her conqueror. The reins and skills of government were handed down by a dying empire to a virile papacy. The lost power of the broken sword was rewon by the magic of the consoling word. The armies of the state were replaced by the missionaries of the church moving in all directions along the Roman roads and the revolted provinces, accepting Christianity, again acknowledged the sovereignty of Rome. Through the long struggles of the Age of Faith, the authority of the ancient capital persisted and grew, until in the Renaissance the classic culture seemed to rise from the grave, and the immortal city became once more the center and summit of the world's life and wealth and art. When in 1936 Rome celebrated the 2,689th anniversary of her foundation, she could look back upon the most impressive continuity of government and civilization in the history of mankind. May she rise again. Thank you, patient reader. This concludes the reading of Caesar and Christ by Will Durant. This book was read by Alexander Adams. Additional titles by Will Durant in the Books on Tape Library include Our Oriental Heritage and The Life of Greece. For additional information about them or for help with topics of related interest, please call our customer service department or check our catalog index to find review material. We hope you enjoyed this reading. Please continue listening to sample another Books on Tape bestseller. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.